Amazing. How are you really? Sad? Tired? Overwhelmed? One of the most common questions we ask one another, so often met with short niceties that have us masking our true emotions, closing us off from one another and our collective needs. Emotions are like catapults. They drive our actions, our desires, our well-beings. It's the crack in someone's voice that's about to give way to tears. It's the crinkle in someone's cheeks that's about to turn into laughter. It's the stiffness in someone's body that signifies guarded anger. Emotions are connectors. They allow us to really, really see one another. You see, this connection is what lays the groundwork for empathy and all that it brings with it. Empathy is a buzzword. It's a loaded term, but when it's utilized correctly, we are able to not only bolster our relationships with one another, but also to challenge the institutions of oppression that affect our world today. But first, let's break it down. Empathy has two most common types. Intellectual, which is basically thinking about it from a cognitive perspective, intellectually taking on somebody else's point of view. Or emotional, which is physically feeling what somebody else is feeling. My first run-in with empathy happened in 2012. I was 10 years old, I was in the fourth grade, worried about not much other than my silly band collection, which might I say was pretty impressive. That all changed on August 5th. I walked into my parents' room and I saw a look of odd numbness on their faces. The TV screen was playing in the back and I saw images of six sick men and women. Under the headline, white nationalist opens fire in sick Gurdwara. I was shocked. I felt this weight on my chest and this profound sadness that I had no clue how to process. I had never seen my community on a television screen before. And the first time that I did, it was because of a shooting at a sick place of worship. In that moment, I encountered hate in its most vile form for the very first time. But simultaneously, I was introduced to a dear new friend, Empathy. Within hours of the shooting, communities mobilized. People from all different faiths Races, ethnicities were delivering food to Gurdwaras across the country. They were hosting vigils and fundraisers, and they were even mobilizing for gun control laws within a matter of hours. And that's when it clicked for me. These people that had no affinity with the Sikh faith were sharing in the burden of our pain. That was empathy in its most raw and beautiful form. This is my conception of the value, active empathy, referred to by many professionals as compassionate empathy. Basically what it means is using understanding as fuel for action. It goes a step beyond feeling and thinks about how do we grapple with relieving another community of their suffering. For a long time, psychologists have thought about active empathy or compassionate empathy in the purview of interpersonal relationships. How do we go the extra mile for a friend in need? I want to take this idea and zoom out by applying it to some of our most pressing and pervasive issues. I want to use it as a springboard to think about how do we address the injustices that are affecting our communities. Look around us. Our world is on fire. People are hurting at the hands of homophobia, sexism, racism, classism, and so much else that echoes from violent pasts of colonialism and imperialism. From structural violence to a climate crisis to a mental health pandemic and vast socioeconomic inequities. It sometimes feels like the world we were handed has more bad than good, more harm than healing. 
So the question becomes, how do we turn pain into power? Active empathy can become a prized tool in our mobilization toolbox because what it allows us to do is overcome gridlock. It allows us to take control in a very special type of way. What it's all about at the end of the day is thinking about how do we share in each other's burdens while making sure to amplify the communities that have been affected. A study done by the American Personality and Social Psychology Review found that the average American today is less empathetic than 75% of Americans 30 years ago. At first glance, this is pretty shocking because it tells us how much we're lacking today, but it also begs the question, if we were so empathetic all that time ago, then why were the same institutions of harm still in place? Now that is precisely why I've been harping so much on this action element. Because we can have as much empathy as we want, but if it's not infused with action, we will not be able to move and shake the world around us. The good news for us comes from Professor Jamil Zaki at Stanford University, who tells us that empathy is dynamic. It's like a skill. It's like a muscle. It's something that we can practice at and get better at connecting with one another. So let's take it to the gym and think about the three major ways that we can build active empathy through the lens of social justice. Number one, storytelling. Human beings operate off of what we can feel, and storytelling is our most powerful instrument to do that. For a long time within the United States, marginalized communities have been told that our stories and experiences don't matter or aren't important enough. But storytelling allows us to reclaim that microphone. An example of this is deep canvassing, which is basically this process where people will go door to door and talk to folks who disagree with them. They'll have conversations, they'll tell stories, and they'll listen. This has been found to actually work on ballot issues regarding trans rights, immigration, and even for candidates. The coolest thing about this is that UC Berkeley professors Brookman and Kala found that the reason that this works is because when we share our narratives with one another, conversations don't take a judgmental tone. And that is the secret sauce that allows minds and hearts to actually change. The coolest part about storytelling though is that it allows us to tap back into ourselves. It allows us to take stock of our emotional bank, which is vital when we try to relate to one another. So think about it. What story do you have to tell? Step number two, introspection. Now this is what comes on the other side of storytelling. This part is not glamorous, but it is necessary. When we're trying to build active empathy, we have to look within ourselves and think about what biases do we unknowingly hold and how do we address them? When another community is struggling from something that we will never experience, it is our job to step back to listen, and then to think about how we act. It's our job to unlearn and seek to understand without placing that burden on the affected community. This means looking for resources. This means looking for stories that have already been shared. And this means being introspective and thinking about if we have harmful behaviors that we haven't taken account for. Step number three. Now this is where it gets interesting. We as human beings can never fully understand what another human being is going through. I, as a Punjabi Sikh American woman, will never know what it's like to fully live in another person's shoes, in another identity. But what we can do is use these stories and this introspection to think about how we take a struggle that was once somebody else's problem and make it our problem. What's an example of this? Come back with me to January 2021. The farmers' protests in India were starting to gear up. 250 million people strong, the largest protest in human history. Protesters, a lot of whom were farmers from Punjab, many of whom were also sick, were protesting laws that damaged their well-being and livelihoods, exploiting small and marginal farmers. The human rights abuses were evident. There were blockades. There was heavy police brutality. There was tear gassing. 
It even got to the point where I would open up my phone and every single day I would see elderly men and women being run over by tractors and sitting in the bitter cold for days on end. I felt hopeless. I didn't know what to do. The sick community in the United States and in the Western world were trying to make our voices heard. We were trying to gain traction, get the media to cover the story, but it seemed like we were screaming into a void. So one day, I got on my social media and I told my story to my friends and family. I told folks why I was hurting, why my community was hurting, and why this was sitting so heavy on my soul. And something sparked because the next morning, I had tons of reshares on that post. My friends saw my pain and helped me turn it into power. My older cousin and I decided to organize a fundraiser. And before we knew it, people from all backgrounds were sharing our information, were donating, were helping us in countless ways. And we ended up making $25,000. The burden was shared. Now look, empathy isn't going to magically fix every single societal ill. We need policy. We need a radical reimagination of the way that our world looks. But what active empathy does is allows us to see these actions as within our realm of impact. When we turn on the news, it's so easy to see all of these problems and think about it as away from us but active empathy gives us the tools to make it personal, to make it actionable. So, to close off, I ask you to take a look at the person sitting right next to you. They might be your best friend, they might be a stranger, but bear with me for a second and do it, as awkward as it feels. Look into their eyes and think about how they have a story. They have lived through things that you will never experience, and you have lived through things that they will never experience. Healing our fractured world starts with the person sitting right next to you. So, I ask you, before you leave today, ask that person, how are you doing, really? Thank you so much. <laughs>